Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. The dean was helping out. Thank you, each and every one of you, for attending our diversity panel presentation this afternoon. This is one of several activities during Diversity Week that our Career Service Center and the Office of Diversity and Inclusion have sponsored for Diversity Week. So we are so happy that you are here. We hope that you will sit, sit back and listen and observe the kind of, kinds of experiences and information that they will have to provide and take plenty of notes. Uh, there will be a time for Q&A at the end of the presentations and the moderator will, will give you a hint that it's time for that. Uh, if you have your cell phones on, please mute them or put them on vibrate. And again, thank you for coming. I believe I'm turning this over to our dean. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you, Barbara. Great introduction. Hey, thank you all for coming. We uh, really appreciate it. I'm, I'm really thrilled to see such a fantastic turnout from the students. Um, and I am so proud of the students of the Sam and Walton College of Business. You all are a great, great group of students. Um, this today is, this panel is very important. Uh, you know, we often talk about how Walton, the Walton College values are epic. Students, how many of you are students? Okay, put your hands back down. How many of you have heard us talk about epic? That's pretty good. It wasn't true a few years ago. Epic stands for excellence, professionalism, innovation, and collegiality. Today we're talking about diversity in the workplace. Ladies and gentlemen, you as students are about to enter a workforce that is the most diverse workforce in the history of the United States. And one of the reasons this is important is because of the fact that, you know what? Coming out of the Walton College, we want to develop leaders with epic values. And one thing that a leader does, there are three primary things a leader does. A leader sets direction. But they come up with the direction as a group. A leader gains alignment. And the way you set direction affects the alignment that you have. It means getting other people on board. And a leader provides motivation. You really can't be a good leader because you can't gain alignment and provide motivation if you don't have an awareness and understanding of diverse groups. And that is true more than ever. So. One of the reasons this panel is so important is because they're going to be giving you insights into diversity in the workplace, which you need to understand. Because we want you to come out of here as leaders. The world is short on leaders. The world needs leaders. And they don't just need leaders. They need leaders that are caring and kind and compassionate and that have epic values like we have in the Walton College. So students, you can't imagine how thrilled I am as the Dean of the Walton College to see so many people here. I hope that you take every word in, try to learn as much as you can. And while I'm not introducing the panel, I'm going to thank them. Of course, I know, I know two of them really well. I know Todd and I know Ebony. Um, Todd uh, has done a great amount for us. He's always willing to help the Walton College. Thank you, Todd, for doing that. I'm, I'm not introducing him. I'm just saying thank you to him. <laughs> and Abby, I'm, Ebony, I'm not introducing you either, but I'm thanking you. Um, Ebony works at General Mills, and I have a special heart for General Mills. 
Not just because I like Wheaties. Maybe a little bit more because I like Grand's Biscuits and Grand Cinnamon Rolls, but that's not it either. But I, my, my oldest daughter has been working there for two and a half years and loves it. Um, and she's told me that it's got a very diverse kind of a orientation, and I think Ebony's one of the reasons. Ebony is a leader. Ebony, thanks for always being willing to help us out. The other two people on the panel, I, I don't know, but I just want to thank you. <laughs> Seriously, I, I mean it. I, I really do thank you. One I just met is from uh, Academy. Um, and, and the other one, where are you from? Walmart. Walmart. Okay, so you went from Academy. I already said hello <laughs> to. What's your name? Russell. Russell? Yeah. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Um, I appreciate it. So uh, today, as the panel speaks, these are people that have lots of experience and lots of knowledge. Barbara, where are you? Where's Barbara? Did she step out? I wanted to thank her. I won't do it later, but I'll thank her right now. No, I'm kidding. I'll thank her later. Uh, because I know she's, she is a leader in our college in this direction, and we're fortunate. We are I think we were the first SEC school to have an Office of Diversity and Inclusion. Um, once again, we were ahead of the curve there. Uh, but uh, I also want to thank Meredith. Meredith, you've done a lot to help us there as well. And I'm sure there's other people I should thank. Um, hey, one other thing I wanted to mention, um, and I've, some of you have heard me say this before, and I think you four will probably resonate with this. You're in school, and sometimes you feel like you haven't started your career yet, but you have. The network that you develop today, right, it will affect the rest of their career, won't it? Absolutely. Now, you have started your business already, even though you're just a student. Learn everything you can. Build a good network. And I want to say one more thing about that. Develop a diverse network. Reach out to diverse people around you. Welcome them, love them, bring them in to what we're doing here. Thank you all so much for doing this. Appreciate it. Hi, everyone. My name is Meredith Adkins. I direct the Employer Relations team in the Career Center. And I'm going to take just a moment to introduce our moderator before uh, he introduces his panel. Um, so Todd Jenkins is the Senior Diversity, Inclusion, and Innovation Leader at J.B. Hunt. Um, one thing that I will say about Todd is that if you know anything about social networks, if you learned about this in your management theory, Todd is sort of the, you know, that, that pillar in the middle. He knew every single person on this panel, and he did not select his panel. And they all work for different companies, and their jobs don't intersect, but everybody knew him, so I've been impressed. Um, actually, I knew Todd, too, having nothing to do with this panel. So we love having Todd come and moderate. He moderated this panel last year as well, so we're really pleased to have him back. Um, Todd is an alumnus of the University of South Carolina, Illinois State University, and University of Arkansas. He serves in various leadership roles, including being on our Diversity and Inclusion Board here at Walton College. Uh, he's received numerous awards, top 12 of Ones to Watch in 2017, the Rodney Moman Award, Rotary International, uh, 30 Under 30 list of minority owned businesses, and I also want to mention his great company, which will explain his bow tie. He is the founder of Bowtie Leadership and Development, a global leadership management and personal development training firm that focuses on bringing diverse people together to increase individual or organizational productivity and performance. And I also want to bring up Dr. Bowtie Todd's personal philosophy, Bowtie It All Together, serve and be a gift unto the world. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Todd to get us started. Awesome. Can we give a round of applause for this awesome leadership? <laughs> we, we don't have a lot of time. We only got 45 minutes. And diversity conversations can take 45 years, clearly. That's why we're still here um, talking about this. So we're going to have fun tonight. We're going to talk about some things that may make you a little uncomfortable. But hopefully that uncomfortability will help 
you grow so you can make other people are comfortable around you as you continue uh, to go through life. So before I get started into where we're going to go and have fun today, I'm going to have our panelists uh, really introduce themselves. Just kind of tell a very quick um, highlights of who they are and why they're interested in this work and um, that brought them here to the panel today. So we're going to go ahead and start with Chris Smith, the great Chris Smith. I've known Chris for a while now, but Chris, go ahead and give your awesome introduction. Thank you for having me here. Um, my name is Chris Smith. I went to the University of Arkansas, graduated with a bachelor's in both political science and public administration here. Um, I spent some time at Walmart, and I'm currently employed at Academy Sports and Outdoor. Um, anyone looking for a job, we're hiring. <laughs> we'll be here all week. We will be here after that. But I think the thing that really turns me on about this or really is is really recognizing some of the differences of what's going on, but really the opportunity to meet, learn new people, individuals, and really be able to drive some things that's going on within our business. So connecting people to the brand of the business and really being able to m improve that. Awesome. Give a round of applause for Chris. Now we're going to go over Miss Wyatt, Miss Ebony. All right, I'm Ebony Wyatt. I'm a 2003 graduate of the Walton College with a degree in finance. I work for General Mills. I've been there for the past 15 years. I've started as an intern, and I am now the director of sales on the Walmart team. Just recently relocated back to Northwest Arkansas from Minneapolis about seven weeks ago. Um, so very happy to be here. It's important that I come, not only for today's panel, but every year I come back to support our recruiting efforts because it's important for two reasons. One, that you see somebody um, that is a Walton College alumni who is successful at the company. And then two, um, for those uh, young women or people of color, it's really important to see someone that looks like them. And so I'm very intentional about my time and I wanted to be here today, and I'm happy to share with you. And thanks for everyone who put this together, and thank you guys for showing up today. Awesome. Round of applause for Ebony. <laughs> Last but definitely not least, we're going to go up yonder to Walmart. Hey, Russell, tell us about yourself. Yeah, thanks, Todd. Uh, thanks, everybody, for having me here. Uh, my name is Russell Schaefer. I'm a director in the Office of Culture, Diversity, and Inclusion at Walmart. Um, uh, standing in for uh, my boss, Ben Hassan, our chief diversity officer. So if you were expecting Ben, um, I am not him. Um, the good news is, is I'm his speechwriter, so if you close your eyes, it'll be almost like he's here, because I'll probably say the exact same things he would have said. <laughs> that is very true. Uh, <laughs> um, but I've, I've spent um, most of my career working at Walmart, uh, been with the company since uh, 2005, uh, actually started um, as a college kid, um, paying my way through school with Walmart, left the company for a few years, and went and uh, worked in PR and advertising for some other companies like May Department Stores, the Timken Company, uh, et cetera. I'm a graduate of Malone University in Canton, Ohio, home of the Pro Football Hall of Fame, uh, where I majored in business administration and communication arts. Uh, and I come to this diversity and inclusion uh, work kind of from the background as a person with a disability. When I was 10 years old, uh, I was diagnosed with a genetic degenerative generative uh, condition that led to my blindness in my late 20s. Uh, so I really come at the, the work of diversity and inclusion, um, advocating uh, largely for those individuals who are often thought of as being the silent D in diversity, those people with disabilities, uh, but also thinking about intersectionality and how disability cuts across and how we advocate for people from all uh, backgrounds and experiences. I'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, and in my spare time, um, I have the great privilege of serving as the chair of the American Foundation for the Blind, uh, one of the nation's leading nonprofits uh, working on disability inclusion. Awesome, give it up for Russell. So as you all can see, before we dive into things, we have a very qualified panel here. And so hopefully we're gonna get some good insight for the next uh, 30, 40 minutes that we have before we open up for Q&A. So a couple of things we wanna level set. First, raise your hand if you're a freshman, first year student, all right, sophomores, juniors, uh, seniors, you're gonna be a graduating senior, like December, May. All right, but you're graduating. You already got, okay, great. Uh, graduate students. Okay, they, oh, there we go. Somebody's getting a job. Um, and any other faculty or staff that's here? Uh, whoa, okay, the faculty corner. All right, wonderful. So what to level set, 
you kind of heard this thing called bow tie. I'm going to teach you very quickly. This is for us to have a great 30, 40 minutes. Are y'all ready to learn why they call, no. Bow tie tied is an acronym. Everyone say B. B. Okay, so this. Everyone say B. B. All right, that's a little bit better. All right, B stands for be mentally and physically present. So I know uh, Dr. Loft told you to cut off your phones, mute them or something, but we, I need you to be here with me. Come, I'm going to be all up in your face, okay? Um, everyone say O. Oh. Oh. We're going to share different ideas and belief systems. The only thing I'm asking you to do is be open. Be open to new ideas, okay? Everyone say W. W. W, be willing to share your own perspective. Okay, if we call on you, don't speak for everybody in the room. Speak for yourself, okay? Be willing to share and own your own perspective. Um, anybody here wear bow ties? Oh, I knew you were cool. All right, all right, there you go. Well, if you wear a bow tie, look at them. If you wear a bow tie, the hardest thing of a bow tie is this knot in the middle. And I find that very hard for presentations like this. How do you tie it together? How do you come in and lead better than you came? Okay, so that's the bow tie. Be here, be open, be willing, but tie something together. Write it down. You're not going to be able to hear and, and receive everything, but pick three things that you enjoy that you want to change and write them down, okay? All right, is that okay? Oh, we, all right, all right. We can make it happen. So as we go into this panel, the first question that always come up is, how do you define diversity and inclusion? You know, this word diversity and inclusion. And to level set, due to time, diversity is gonna be defined for the panel, uh, and, I, and I would love the panelists to chime in onto this, but diversity is visible and invisible differences. Visible differences, like, you know, I'm a good looking guy, I have on a bow tie, I'm a proud African American, I'm a, a male, like those are visible differences, right? Invisible difference. You may not know that I'm one of 11 kids. I speak Portuguese and I'm married. I'm happily from South Carolina, born in the inner city, okay? Visible differences, what you see physically. Invisible, your backgrounds, things you can't see, your experiences where you were raised. And guess what? Everyone in here is diverse. I know you didn't know that, but. I'm just telling you, okay? Inclusion, inclusion is being able to respect all of those individual, uh, invisible and visible differences to create an equitable, high-performing organization. That's inclusion. Equitable, equity. Equity is very simple. I use the words equity instead of equality because equality is simple. I give everyone here a shoe, okay? You get a shoe, you get a shoe, you get, you get a shoe in the back. But equity is giving everyone here a shoe that fits them. And that's a little more challenging to do in the workplace. So we're gonna talk about that. And I also let, like to let people know, inclusion, guess what? Everyone is included in that, including straight white guys. Yeah, you're right, yeah, I'm talking to you. Because when we talk about diversity and inclusion, everyone think about everybody else except for white straight men. I see this in the workplace. I think about people of color, disabilities, women, but everybody in this room is included in this conversation today. Is that okay? All right, great. So go ahead and get started. When we go into the workplace panelists, they talk about the business case for inclusion. Do anybody want to chime in? Let's start with Ebony. You've been with General Mills for a while, and you have kind of seen this transition happen from this movement of compliance to diversity, education, to inclusion. What is today's business case of why we even have this in the workplace? So for General Mills, if you think about our products, so we make everything from Cheerios to Grand's Biscuits to, to Wheaties, um, YoPlay and a ton of other products. Um, we have to think about who actually uses our products. And they aren't all white, they aren't um, all young, they aren't all old. Um, and so for us to be able to think about how we market those products, we need to know the core, who the consumer is, why they buy our products. And if we all look alike within General Mills and we all think the same and we all went to the same school, it's really hard to connect to the consumer. 
So for us, it's really about making sure that we have a connectivity to our consumers and that our workforce reflects that. Um, if you think about how uh, even you guys as millennials are changing and um, you're making different choices in terms of the food you eat faster than ever, um, we have to have that uh, perspective represented within our company so we can launch the right products, so we can make sure we're re reaching all uh, different targets. And so for us, it's really just understanding our core consumer. That's the business case for us. And we cannot truly market our brands and launch products that hit the core consumer if we don't know how to identify with them. So as you all can see, diversity is good for business and it helps you get more profit. So if you want more money, <laughs> You're going to talk to me, right, about diversity. And that has been very interesting coming through the Fortune 500 companies and in the workplace. It's starting a new type of conversation. As you all can see, we all know our demographics are shifting every day. I mean, really, it's shifting, changing every day. And in order for us to continue to meet our consumers, especially who's in here business majors? Okay, so see, y'all want more, everybody want to make more money, right? That's kind of, I don't know, with this greedy, but people want to make more money. And if you want to make more money, you want to meet the people where they're at, and you want to represent the, um, the stakeholders you serve. So going along with the next question of putting the business case, everybody understand the business case, right? It's a business case where everyone is included and everyone is valued, okay? Um, so putting the business case in action. That's a little bit challenging. Russell, will you speak to us a little bit about how, what does action look like with the diversity business case being put into motion in the workplace? Yeah, thanks for the question, Todd. So um, just a level set, and since I can't see hands go up, give me a yes if you've ever heard of Walmart. Yes. <laughs> you ever been in one? Yes. Okay. How many of you shopped on Amazon? Okay, that's not so good, but no. I'll let it slide. So, so when you think about you know the retail industry, you think about Walmart. Um, you know, if you know a little anything about our history, um, you know we were actually one of the original disruptors of the retail industry. You know, back in the late '80s, Walmart. Um, you might be surprised to know did not sell groceries. You know, as recently as about 30 years ago. And from a standing start, Walmart went from not selling groceries to developing and introducing the Supercenter format, and within less Less than a decade being the nation's largest grocer. That's the essence of disruption. On the other side of the equation, you've got Amazon over here who has been the original disruptor of e-commerce. And so when you think about where retail is going right now, you got Walmart on one side, kind of the, the purveyor of the bricks and mortar, and Amazon, the, uh, the, the creator of e-commerce um, superstore. Uh, what we find ourselves in today is a race to the middle. The company that can figure it out the, the, the best and the, the fastest is going to be the one that's ultimately the most successful. You see Amazon acquiring Whole Foods, starting to look at other bricks and mortar um, opportunities. You got Walmart uh, acquiring Jet.com, Bonobos, um, ModCloth, you know, and building out our own e-commerce capabilities, all for the express purpose of trying to figure out how do you create a frictionless uh, environment and experience for your customers um, so that they can you know not only save money live better as you know as we've made our mantra at Walmart but more than that so that they can save time they want convenience and so in order to be able to do that in order to be able to figure out how to put those two seemingly divergent elements of bricks and mortar retail and e-commerce together you've got to have an environment where you have people who think about things differently you know in order to innovate or come up with new ideas, you've got to differentiate. And in order to differentiate, you need to have diversity, which we define at Walmart as a workforce or community uh, with unique experiences, styles, ideas, identities, abilities, and opinions. In order for that diversity to work, you have to have an inclusive environment where these diverse people come together and are able to collaborate. Inclusion comes from creating a culture and having leaders who actively engage, support, and champion 
all of that uniqueness in order to empower and inspire individuals to be high performers. So that's what we're trying to do at Walmart is to not only create an environment where, as Todd said, um, you know, individuals who are visibly diverse, people of different ethnicities, genders, sexual orientations, people with disabilities, et cetera, are able to work together, have their voices be heard in order to be able to move the business, but that we also have this notion of functional inclusion as well, where our store operators and our programmers and uh, e-commerce folks are able to see that they are not working in opposition together, but they're actually working together as one for the sole purpose of serving our customers so that they can save money and live better. That's, for us, the essence of uh, the business case for diversity and inclusion is that in order to run a business, you've got to have people who see the business differently, but you've got to have an environment where those differences are valued and supported and able to uh, yield results for your end customer, whoever that might be. Awesome. Appreciate that, Russell. So you, we talk about internal business case, but we live in this global world. How many of you all have actually uh, been able to do study abroad? Yeah, how many of you all would like to do study abroad or go outside the country and do some cool stuff? So when you talk about globalization, uh, Chris, I would love to get your opinion on this. When it comes to foreign policy and global diversity, how does that impact the business case and, and where are we at today? Well, you may not want to answer too much of this, but um, if you want to talk about the foreign trade and policy and how does it impact our work here in the U.S., uh, or just where does it fit in with the narrative of diversity? I think there's one thing that's certain, and it's uncertainty is something that we're sitting in today. Since 2016, or since the election, really, there's been this change. Historically, U.S. foreign policy has really been about spreading democracy across the world, whether that's diversity of thought um, through some of the you know, thought leadership or teachings, but also um, it's in action, right? And so whether that be from a military perspective in terms of really engagement with boots on the ground or even from a um, financial perspective, the U.S. gives out about $5 billion a year um, you know, from foreign aid. If you look at that, most of those people that we give money to or most of those countries that we give money to are not our allies, right? And so a lot of that has to do with just being able to create some sense, some, some sense of normalcy, I guess, within the world in terms of what happens. What you've seen since 2016 has really been this whole shift and really a focus on whether it's America first or nationalism, you're seeing it. Um, and European nations as well. Um, and really it's about, you, what we don't want to be is we don't want to be penny wise, pound foolish, right? You don't want to think about, hey, let's save this billion dollars here. Or can I you know, spend these funds and do something else? And really looking kind of at the bigger picture. And I think that's something that is starting to really happen across the world. The, the fear in terms of what's going on is that we're creating a vacuum when we kind of pull out. And when you have a vacuum, there's one of two things that's going to happen. Either you're going to have someone that steps in and takes up that space, or you're going to have some things that implode on the inside. Um, one of the things that you will see within what's going on now, really in the past six months, has been this whole trade war with China. Um, you know, the U.S. has a very large deficit with China. Um, as we have started to pull out in terms of a number of countries, China has been that country that has come in and really making investments. Anywhere that you go, I've traveled to 25, almost 30 countries across the world, and you're starting to see China really take a, a stance in many places, whether that is in Pakistan, you're looking at Jordan, places in Central, South America, even African countries. China is going in and really building infrastructures and really setting up that, that um, there's a potential threat for the U.S., right? If you think of kind of our business model and really what happens, there is a threat that those things are going to happen. And so as we continue to combat and really think about what we do as a nation, we also have to think about the role that we play in the rest of the world. And is that something or how we want to play within the rest of the world? Because if you don't, someone else is going to come in and, and really take that space. Well, I really appreciate you sharing that. And I know, you know, even at J.B. Hunt, it's something that's fascinating um, being there and understanding this from a global standpoint. We are now, uh, when we serve our carrier base, uh, they are very diverse from all over the world, and they speak more than 40 languages. Well, guess what? From the diversity business case, we have to be able to communicate and be able to effectively 
uh, develop relationships. And so guess what we need to do from a business standpoint? We may want to speak those 40 languages. Well, right now we are around 30 languages that we speak at JB Hunt that's um, foreign languages. But what's fascinating about this whole globalization is that even though it's taking place around the entire world, it is impacting your internal DNA about who's been hired, who you serve, to continue to be competitive. And to know a language is to know the culture. Well, you can know the language and to understand the culture that you never experienced. How do you empathize and relate to a customer that you know nothing about? You don't know their culture. You don't want to say the wrong things. You know, how, this is something that I, I, a lot of people want to ask this question, but people are a little afraid to ask. Like, how do you approach someone that looks so different than you are? What is the appropriate way of asking a question? And so I don't know if any of the panelists can just speak very high level. When you see someone that's different than you, a lot of people say, well, hey, it's common sense. Just smile and say hello or give them a handshake. Well, in certain cultures, your smile may mean something else. I may not want to touch you because I don't touch, you know, this type of opposite sets, et cetera. Uh, so any, any best practices from you all and your experience of how to embrace diversity when you don't even know how to approach it, just by the person sitting on your left or right? I can't speak to the global piece of it specifically. I'm just thinking about the world I operate in at General Mills. And one of the things we've been really focused on is empathy building. And that's really making sure that you put yourself in the other person's shoes. So if I think about how it might feel to be a new hire, how am I connecting? How am I building bridges for them? How am, how am I introducing them in a meeting? How am I allowing them opportunities to speak up? And so really my focus and what I try to teach my team is have empathy. Yeah, you may not know, for example, what it's like to be pulled over by the police and be afraid, but let me tell you what my experience looks like. And in that way, we can start to build bridges and start to build understanding versus just us versus them. And so for me, that's been the most impactful kind of journey we've been on in the last year is really a focus on empathy building and understanding where the, the other person's point of view and putting yourself in their shoes. Thank you. You want to add something, Russell? Go ahead. Yeah, I'll just tag on to that. You know, I think, you know, when we talk about what makes an inclusive leader? You know, one of the characteristics is this notion of cultural intelligence. And so I think when you're thinking about how you engage with people from other walks of life, whether it be from um, you know, across town or around the world, I think the more you can learn to educate yourself around what their customs and cultures are, the better equipped you're going to be in order to be able to engage in a dialogue that's, that's meaningful um, and thoughtful uh, and inclusive of, of where they're coming from. But I think also being mindful of you know, this notion that I think we get caught up in the difference so often, uh, yet um, for every, every facet of our identities that's different, you know, realize that there's probably tenfold that are the same. So realizing that, you know, around the world, people have the same wants, uh, dreams, hopes, and desires as, as most all, all of us sitting here in this room. You know, the way in which they go about their day to day might look a little bit different. The foods they eat might be a little bit different, but they still want to love and be loved. They want to do work that's fulfilling. They want to be able to leave a legacy. Um, they want to do good and be valued. And if you find a place to connect in that common ground of the things that we share that are the same, then it creates a natural opportunity to embrace and learn about and appreciate the things about us that are different. Okay, thank you for sharing that. And you will see that as you continue to get into this work stream or even as you grow into your career, um, emotional intelligence, empathy, cultural intelligence, those are all platforms that's key for you to be an inclusive and effective leader. And so if you ever have an opportunity to take classes like that now or experience that in your organizations or student clubs, go after those webinars, try to learn because that really help you appreciate differences and learn how to approach um, different cultures and different backgrounds. And that's very key. That's very, very key in the workplace because right now, most it's human nature. You're gonna go where you can survive. So you're gonna to try to find people that look like you, you identify or identify with to just survive. It's this comfortability. And right now we all survive and in this room we're okay because we're all Razorbacks. Well, guess what? When you go into the workplace, you got 
Gamecocks, you got all these other people that you were taught to be rivals against. And you, what do you do? Do I go say hello? Do I say no and put my Razorback stuff up? You know, you, you struggle with things like this in the workplace. And so how do you learn to empathize with someone that's so different than you? These are key traits because you don't want just because they roll tide and I'm a Razorback and I'm not going to talk to them so I won't ever get a promotion. I don't think that's going to step in the way of your promotion. If so, we need to really work on the curriculum to get you <laughs> to empathize a little bit better that we are all from different ways, but we're all striving for the same thing. Um, and so you'll also learn another concept about unconscious bias. We do a lot of unconscious bias training at J.B. Hunt. They do it at Walmart. They do it at Academy. They do it at a lot of different places. And it teaches you how to be a little more aware of all the experiences you bring to the table that may get in the way uh, how you connect with someone. And it's very interesting, like we receive over millions of bits of information every second, but we only can retain 37. Guys, 21. So it's a struggle bus, okay? So if that's the true stat, that means 99.99996% of our daily operation is in our unconsciousness. That's mind blowing, literally. But think about it, when you're driving on the road and you're thinking about everything else except for those two little lines, it was a conditioned behavior. And when you become conditioned, it becomes second, it, it doesn't, it's not a conscious effort. Like everyone is sitting down, no one here is standing up. No one is here in front of me saying, hey Todd, you have learned that when someone is speaking, especially from a podium, you sit down and listen. So if that's a learned behavior, you've been learning this for 20 years of life, that a certain view and a certain perspective is right, it's kind of hard to change that if you're not aware or, you're not, or accept a different opinion if you're not aware that you bring that to the table, okay? So that's a key takeaway, unconscious bias. You should learn it, learn about your own experience. So now we go into the workplace and we understand that it's different support channels in the workplace. Um, you have offices like my office, like diversity and inclusion. You have affinity groups, employer resource groups, um, a lot of outreach efforts and philanthropy efforts, diversity recruiting, diversity marketing, <laughs> like it's a lot of different channels. Um, if someone is going into the workplace, how can one learn about these groups? Um, what do these groups entail? So do you all know about affinity groups? Most, most times, students may not know. Can you, Ebony, I know you're involved with, and the president of one, uh, will you talk to us about affinity groups and what they bring to the table? Yeah. Let, me, let me do my best to define affinity groups. Um, so at General Mills, we have several affinity groups for really underrepresented groups. And it's really a place um, for networking, a place for connection. Um, and a place of support. And so if I think about it, General Mills, we have diversity groups uh, across ethnicity. So for example, I'm a member of the Black Champions Network. Um, we have across our gay, lesbian, and transgender community, which is called Betty's Family at General Mills. Uh, we also have a women's leadership network um, that's an affinity group or a support group for women uh, because women are generally underrepresented in business and within leadership positions. And so um, it's just a way to build community and to make sure that folks who might not um, otherwise feel connected to the company, it's a great way to know that you have a safe space where you can share and learn. I know at General Mills, one of the things that we really focus on is development uh, within those groups. And so, for example, I might go to a, uh, a workshop within the Black Champions Network where we talk about executive presence, or we may talk about common issues that face uh, black women in corporate America, and how do we debunk some of the myths that might be out there. Um, if I think about being a part of, I'm also a part of the Women in Sales Network, and so really that's making sure that I'm creating opportunities for other young women, um, helping them to understand how to navigate uh, within sales and within General Mills, how to influence the customer. So really, it's really about support, it's really about learning and development, um, and then for us at General Mills, we allow anybody to be a part of those groups. You don't have to be a part of that 
for example, Black Champions Network, if you're a white male and you want to be an ally to that group, uh, we welcome allies. So we have several folks that just come to our uh, development sessions to learn and to understand and really to, to drive more empathy and understanding of what it might be like to be an African American. And so just because you see these groups, I don't want anyone to ex assume you're excluded because that's not the point of it. Um, I've been asked at work a couple times by some of my white male counterparts, well, there's not a white male group, so where can I play a role? And so instead of giving them the sharp-tongued answer back or the joke back is to say, you know what, I welcome you to be a part of the Black Champions Network and to come and learn more and figure out how we can best support one another. And so just thinking through how do we, how do we build those bridges and make sure that people are, know that those affinity groups are for all um, and people can participate in them. So at General Mills, that's one of the things that makes it so special. Um, not only do we have affinity groups, we, have, we also now have inclusion councils. So anybody can be a part of those. You really don't have to feel like I have to be a part of this group. So we have one within sales that's called our Sales Diversity and Inclusion Council. So they may do everything from um, have a talk about unconscious bias to they may uh, have a Black History Month celebration. So it's a little bit of everything, but everybody is invited to be a part of those. So I know that's what General Mills does. My perspective, I've been nothing but positive in terms of um, feeling connected to the company through those groups, as well as getting some additional development in areas where um, I needed that development. So that's been my experience with Affinity Networks. Okay, and as you all can see, it's, I mean, it's tons of different Affinity Networks, depending on the company. I think that is a great question in your interview to ask, what type of Affinity Groups. Uh, I, if you are a white individual who asks about affinity groups, especially as a white male, and the company gets shocked that you ask, that might not be the right company for you to be going if they don't feel like you are accepting to that type of affinity group. Because you do get that in the workplace. Oh, well, I don't have this group, or can I join the women's group? Can I join the gay group? Can I join this? And it's all the affinity groups are open to all um, in every company, and they have several different affinity groups. Um, and affinity groups also do um, mentorship, professional development, and things of, like, things of that nature. But if you're not a part of the affinity group, one thing I want to ask for the question um, for the panel is how can you be an ally? Like, you know, I'm not on the diversity team. I'm not the diversity person. I'm not, I'm not even an affinity group. But how can I be an advocate and, and an ally on my own team? You know, um, <clears throat> I spent 15 years at Walmart um, to start of my career. And going to a smaller company, and I say smaller, $5 billion company at Academy, I was a little shocked that there were some things that we didn't have, right? Um, you know, at much larger companies, there's very different um, things that go on, and they're and a little bit more streamlined. And I simply asked the question of, you know, what affinity groups are there, or what's the diversity policy, and kind of got a few questions and didn't really know. And I immediately, I think I got a little upset. And so I started scheduling all these meetings, right? I went to, I said, I'm going to go talk to the CEO of the company. I'm going to go talk to head of HR, and I really, I went down and I started going through a lot of those conversations, and the first thing that I found out was that, you know, there are things that are on the docket that are coming, and our company is doing some things, and really they're going to be released for next year, but it was really one of those things of you have to ask the question first and really figure out how to get engaged and to drive some change, and the thing I would tell everyone that's here is regardless of what role you serve in a company, you always have the opportunity or the ability to go create and drive change. If you see something that's happening or that isn't happening that you think needs to be there, go ask the question. Go start and really talk about it and see what you do. And, and for me as a leader, and as you get to that level, for me as a leader, I think about diversity every time I have an open position of hiring. Every time we go through on kind of on a quarterly basis and review talent, we're looking at that. And it's not from a a gender perspective or necessarily just a gender perspective or race or any of those things. It's looking at to say, how can I make the team different to be able to drive some results within the business? And I think of it that way of you don't want to in team full of yourself, regardless of how smart you are, regardless of how strong you are, how good you are. If you have an entire team of just you, you're not going to be very successful in the future. 
you have to have people that are gonna challenge you to think about things differently and really do things differently. And so for me, as I really challenge with, in my own team, but also the people that report to me and as they build their teams, is we need to look at and make sure that we're respecting it and that we're also looking and trying to hire to that. We're asking those right questions. And it's again, it's not about how someone looks or what they look or how they, it's really about bringing in diversity of thought, really bringing in diversity of, in terms of how all those things go because that's what really drives it. So I think of it really on two levels is one, drive change, but also be a change agent as you get to a level that will allow you to bring someone else up and come through the organization. Okay, Russell? Yeah, I would just add to that, um, you know, we just uh, wrapped up um, developing a training curriculum around uh, leading with our values at Walmart that's, you know, service to the customer, uh, respect for the individual, strive for excellence, and act with integrity. Uh, and as part of this training, we um, tapped a number of our senior leaders to talk about what uh, leading with our values, what creating an inclusive culture looks like. And uh, one of our leaders that participated in that was our, was our um, CFO, Brett Biggs. And so one of the, one of the sound bites from um, the, the content that stands out to me was, you know, Brett saying, you know, when I'm thinking about building my organization, I don't want an organization full of Brett Biggs. I've, I already know what Brett thinks. Mm -hmm. I want people who think differently. And, and to that end, you know, Brett is, um, a conservative, straight, able-bodied white male um, from um, central Arkansas. Uh, he, um, he, he, he went to Harding, so, um, you know, uh, pretty, pretty conservative guy. And so, you know, as a leader of an organization, it would be really easy to populate an organization of, of accountants and finance guys who, who look and think a lot like Brett. But Brett actually takes an active role to step out. He has um, hosted the board of the National Association of Black Accountants here. He goes to their conference and keynotes. Just last week, uh, he spoke at a diversity MBA conference. So he is all in and leans in to be the type of leader that creates an organization that is differentiated, that has different points of view and different backgrounds so that we really do get the ROI. And believe me, as the CFO, he is focused on ROI. And he realizes that the business case for diversity and inclusion is akin to the business case for profit. <laughs> you can't run a successful business for very long without profit. And you can't run a successful business very long if you're not diverse and inclusive either. Awesome. Thank you for that. You hit a, a really a, a good point that, and I want you all to conclude with your final thoughts. So what advice do you have that the students can do now today? One advice that they can do today that can help impact their journey to diversity. And I want you all to start thinking about questions that you may have for us as the panelists. But one key thing Russell said that we talk a lot about in the diversity space, especially with our counterparts, is leaning in. Lean in. On the count of three, I want everyone to lean in. One, two, three. See, some people don't even know what that means. That's why I got to break it down. All right. I know some of y'all sleep, wake them up, hit them in the No, don't hit them too hard. Uh, but lean in. On the count of three, we want you to lean in. One, two, three. There we go. So this is very, very key. This is my first advice to you as students. See how all y'all love to sit back and chill and wait till the world come to you and wait till somebody say hello? No. In, in the diversity space, you have to learn and be comfortable with leaning in. You have to be, your ears have to perk. When someone say something that does not sound right, you, you want to lean in and understand where they're coming from with that. Or if someone is not speaking up for people that you know, that they should be speaking up for it. You want to lean in and be that advocate, okay? You can lean in very, the platform really came from understanding someone else's differences. You want to, instead of sitting back and just acting like you're not engaged, which we learned to do in college, but you need to get engaged and, and lean in and ask some of these questions. And I would ask you, I would, my first advice to you to do, start practicing that with each other. Lean in if you're in different organizations. I know this is business school. Most of you probably all in fraternity and sororities. Learn to lean in with each other. You lean in in sisterhood and brotherhood. If you're not in fraternity and sorority, you have college roommates, et cetera. Learn to lean in. But also learn to lean in with people that does not look like you. That will really, really help kind of 
really catapult your, your cultural competency level. So that's my first advice. I go to the panel, have them wrap up with their one advice to you, then we'll open it up for Q&A. Whoever would like to start. Russell? Sure, so my advice to you is be courageous and be curious. So um, be cur uh, courageous to share your story. You know, so often I hear people say, oh, I don't have a diversity story. Everybody has a diversity story. When two or more people gather, there's diversity. Know your story, um, feel empowered to share it, and be curious and open to receiving others with empathy. Thank you, Russell. Um, Ebony? Man, that was good. <laughs> Ditto. No, I'm just kidding. Um, you guys have an amazing opportunity now in college. If I think about when I came to the U of A, I came from a very... You know, all the folks in my neighborhood looked a certain way. A lot of people in my high school were very similar. And then college was really my first experience where I met people that were international, that were from the big city, that um, whose parents had these crazy big jobs or um, that were very different than me. And so make sure that you take advantage of the person sitting next to you in class or the person down the hall um, in the residence hall because this is your first opportunity for some of you guys to have an experience that's different than what it was like at home. And so I tell you to take advantage of that now, because when you get into a corporate job or whether it's a, you decide to be an entrepreneur or whatever, you will be expected to figure out how to interact with different folks. It won't be okay that you've never been around a person that looks like this or from this type of background. It's not an excuse. And so the more you learn to interact with others, the more you learn to build empathy, the more you learn how to network with folks that don't look and think like you, the better off you are. And this is an amazing opportunity to do so right here at the University of Arkansas. Thank you, Ebony. Chris, final thoughts? Two things I would share is network and show your worth. You know, if you think about it, networking really is that opportunity to lead you to the door. Right, but it's not gonna get you through there. I think the thing that's gonna really drive change for you is really showing your worth. As you go on interviews for jobs, for anything else that may be going on as you're hiring people, people are gonna ask you a question. What is it that you're gonna bring to my team that I don't already have? Or what is it that you bring to the company that I don't already, already have? Because you start thinking about your, your skill sets, your talents, your, you know, everything that you have somebody else probably has it as well, right? And so as you start to go through that, when you go to interviews and really have those conversations, you're selling yourself for the reason that you are different than everybody else that's on that team and why you're gonna be able to drive something that's gonna change and make an, a difference or an impact within that company. So as you go through your career, network, show your worth, and you'll be successful. Awesome, awesome. So we're going to get ready to open it up for Q&A. As the panelists I said to you before, you know, it's, do you have an incredible opportunity now? See, in college, you think everyone is judging you. That's why you're trying to be so cool. But you're going to get a job and you're going to grow up. So the thing is, it's okay to do different stuff. Like go to uh, MPHC Step Show or go to and get involved with if you are this political party, try to see what the other political party is talking about with their organization. Or if you've never been with the disability organization, go get, this is the time now. You have no, well, you are stressed with exams and all that stuff. But, you know, this is a time to explore and really develop some of those skills that when you get into the, the workforce, you're going to be thinking about work every day. And you may not have all the opportunity of all of this diversity that's in the room. So learn to take advantage of that uh, while you're here. And it's incredible um, if, if you can and, and, and to do that. Another thing I would tell you is, how many of you all have a mentor? Raise your hand. Raise your hand if your mentor, put your hand down if your mentor is your, your parents. Yeah, I usually get that a lot. Yeah. So sometimes your mentors are parents. I'm not knocking that. Now, that's your mom and daddy. So I did not say they can't be your mentor. But what I am saying, I'm, I'm challenging you to find two mentors. And don't take this the wrong way. One who looks like you and one who does not. I guarantee you ask them the same question. It may be a little different. Find a mentor. I'm pretty sure you have a lot of faculty and staff in the back here that would love to, if you come in their office and have a candid conversation about diversity, they're your folks. You have anybody from academy? 
Got Academy folks here. Raise your hand. We want to see you, girl. All right. You got, you got your folks here? Uh-oh. Uh-oh. There you go. We got any Walmart folks? Uh, it's okay. Y'all so big. We know. Uh, and uh, my J.B. Hunt family. I saw some of them in the back and over there. Okay. So we, these are people that's here that's living and breathing and as a corporate representative and really living this work every day that's not in the direct space. Get to know them. Get the mentorship. All right, so we're gonna we have about five minutes for questioning. Um, anybody have any questions that they want to throw out at us? Anything? All right, tell us your name. company is too huge, then you know the top level people understanding the diversity is, is very, very important. But I figure like hard, the hardest time, like um, a lot of team, they only understand what they're doing at, at the moment, but they don't really know what other people are doing. So when a CEO or a high level un understanding diversity is very, very important. So what do you think is the best way to make sure everybody in this big company understanding the importance? of diversity. Okay, that's Thank a good you. question. And Russell, I would love to have you chime into this as a big company up here. But I know something that's very, very true and near is first of all, you have to trust your leaders. You have to trust your workers, right? And you also have to have a very intentional conversation. So here at JB Hunt, um, say for example, one of our business units, we look all the VPs. They all look at the people data once a month. That's usually a regular, most companies look at it once a quarter, et cetera. But it goes back down to the values and the mission of the organization. And if it's diversity that's enabling that, it should be always a part of the narrative and the conversation that all employees, no matter how small or large, can get behind. So I think it's making sure it's a strategy around that and alignment from the CEO to the new hire. Yeah, um, just to tack onto that, you know, the, the, the question you know, talked about CEO, and I think, you know, for us, I feel really blessed to work at a company like Walmart where our CEO, Doug McMillan, uh, really believes uh, passionately in creating a culture of inclusion. He wants that to be his legacy. Uh, he actually serves as the chair of our inclusion council, our president's inclusion council, uh, which brings together leaders from around the globe and across the company, people of all different backgrounds. We have, uh, we have a lesbian leader uh, on the inclusion council. We have a disability advocate, and we have people uh, of, of uh, all genders and different races and ethnicities represented on that inclusion council. Uh, and each one of, uh, Ebony talked about affinity groups. At Walmart, we call our groups associate resource groups. Each one of our seven associate resource groups has an executive champion who is a direct report of our CEO, helping that organization, helping shepherd them, mentor them, give them guidance and counsel, uh, open up doors and, and provide access and opportunity, not only for them to be able to get things done, but to be able to bubble up ideas to leadership around things that, that need to be improved, ways in which the business can continue to optimize and to be more inclusive. So in order for things like um, diversity and inclusion to stick and to become a sustainable part of your DNA, uh, it takes commitment of the senior leadership, but it also takes folks at the grassroots level who are willing to roll up their sleeves and do the work. Thank you. Remember, diversity is a journey, not a destination. So we're always learning and growing together. Yes, ma'am. Hey, you were here last year? Yeah. Okay, I, I, thought I, I thought I remember you. <laughs> I remember you too. Awesome. Um, I, yeah, this is a great thing. So as, um, you know, we have a lot of big corporates being represented here, how do you guys deal with complications um, with individuals when it comes to diversity? Does that make sense? So if there's like conflicts between two individuals that maybe might deal with diversity uh, backgrounds, how do you deal with that? Anybody? Okay. I can take it, please. <laughs> I'm going to use a Walmart term just because, but respect for the individual. You know, I have a friend that works for a company, and I won't say the name, but it's a large bank, and um, he said people at work fight, right? That's what they do. He said they, they get into a disagreement, and they fight, and they just body slam people in the office, right? That's not what you do in the job, regardless of if you own a company or if you work for a company. That's not what you do, right? And I think really what it is about is respecting others and really being able to meet them where they are. And then when you're able to do that, that's able to allow you to drive some things or results within the business.
And to add on to that, you got to understand, once I said, this is why it's very, very key when you're looking for jobs and internship, just because the revenue is great and just because they got the nice brand, you really need to make sure you understand the mission and the values of the organization. So we may be disagreeing, but what I'm going to bring out is the value statement. <laughs> and that value statement is going to facilitate the conflict between those two individuals. Because if it's not relating to the values and the mission of the company, therefore this may not be the right place or therefore we need to redirect your energy of frustration. Okay, so that's, I think, us always go back down to the mission and vision of the organization. Thank you all so much. Can we give a round of applause to the panelists? <laughs> it's very, very important to note that your journey starts now. Meyer says it best, diversity, is the invitation to the party, but inclusion is allowing you to dance the way you want to dance. And I know we want to keep dancing. So make sure you smile, have fun, and dance with people that look like you and ones that does not. Thank you, Meredith.